50 years ago on this very day, Channel 5 signed on the air. It was the dream of two local businessmen, Thomas Baker and Alvin Beeman, along with the Life and Casualty Insurance Company. Let's take a look back at how Nashville and Channel 5 have changed over the years. Ben Hall has the story. And it's on the air. Hello, everyone. We'd like you to see WLAC-TV. It all started in 1954. All right, here we are. Roger. WLAC used the tallest television tower in the United States to go on the air. Our 12-bay super turnstile antenna gives us an effective radiated power of 100,000 watts. The first broadcasts were from the first floor of the LNC Tower. I suppose you're wondering how our picture gets from the control room here to you and the comfort of your home. Years later, Roy Smith took viewers on a tour. They look as if we've gone on location, but through the wonders of rear screen projection, we've just moved to the other end of the studio. WLAC had three owners. The Life and Casualty Insurance Company, which gave the station its name, Alvin Beeman, and general manager Thomas B. Baker. It is our purpose to make WLAC television a powerful force for good in your lives. News quickly became the top priority. The first anchor was Al Kenga, and WLAC hired Nashville's first female weathercaster, Jean Hughes, seen here in 1955. You are now in WLAC-TV's news department where our daily newscasts are prepared. Channel 5 has always been on the cutting edge of technology. Channel 5 news photographers are equipped with movie cameras. That it was the first station to use weather radar in 1959. In the last 10 years here in Davidson County. And the first to use color film on a news story. It was also the first in the southeast to use live action cameras. But those first live shots were not easy to set up. Okay, Larry, when you get up there, let's move it to your right. Hold it right there, Larry. Let me check the uh, Plectron now. And in fact, the station's first live shot inside Metro Council ended because council members weren't used to reporters talking during their meeting. And that's it from his, here, Chris, and we'll be seeing you later. <laughs> <laughs> we may have seen television's first live arrest. We don't know, but we'll try to bail Don out. It's 253. We need to cam downtown right away. Channel 5 was also the first TV station in Nashville to use a helicopter in day-to-day -day news coverage. You were on top of it first with exclusive copter cam reports. On. Photographers and reporters work together. The film is edited. But what has always set Channel 5 apart is its people. We have realized this from the beginning and have selected people who have that spark and enthusiasm for their work. You probably remember Bill Jay. He did staff announcing and hosted numerous shows like Popeye and Friends. He was also news anchor until another okay, newsman three, came six. along. Reporters from around the state gather in the governor's office to question him about his opinions on key topics. That man was Chris Clark. With all the uh, comments that we've had from other newsmen about... Chris was hired in 1966 and has been part of News Channel 5 for 38 years. It was not stressful back then. It was, it was a lot of fun back then. We were all 20-somethings doing something that not a whole lot of people were doing at the time. The deadline was 45 minutes. You had to have your film in the film processor 45 minutes for airtime. You got 45 minutes to think about how you're going to write your story. That we don't have deadlines anymore. You know, if it happens, we can put it on the air right away. Now that's stress. <laughs> well, rescue efforts had been slowed at a coal mine near Sullivan, Kentucky. Clark was also the news director when he hired a 19-year-old reporter named Oprah Winfrey. Well, if it is integrated at all into the curriculum, we decided to see where and how. She became weekend anchor before moving on to other things. The country's like a lonesome train. News Channel 5 has not just been known for news. Young country, cause we're changing all the time. Every day, Monday through Friday, Eudora gives out with famous old Southern recipes. Especially in the early days, a number of programs were produced in News Channel 5 studios. And a opacious hello to you. Noble Blackwell hosted Night Train. All aboard the Night Train now boarding. Take a look and you see a young Jimi Hendrix performing in the background. Many up-and-coming entertainers appeared on the show. Love comes tumbling down. <laughs> Toby 
why were there two men in your room last night? And in 1969, Hee Haw was taped in News Channel 5 studio. Those days are gone. But today, Talk of the Town is still produced at News Channel 5 and has been on the air for 20 years. That's right. It is a perfect day for a wedding out here at the... In 1976, WLAC changed its call letters to WTVF. The station has watched Nashville change and grow, and it's been there for some of the city's most terrifying moments. Yeah, that's a tornado on the ground. Yep. Uh, you can see the dramatic pictures as we just lost everything, I think, huh? Get downstairs, come on. Go downstairs. In 1998, a tornado hit downtown and went right over News Channel 5. That was incredible. Knocking the station off the air. With no sound, Chris Clark initially broadcast by holding up a notepad. I wrote a note that we were all okay because I knew that the families of all the employees would be wondering, you know, what happened in downtown to the TV station. That's why I wrote the note, so the families would know if they were watching that we were all right. Hey, Charlie, did you set something up on uh, Router 2? or? We're back on Microwave 2 now. One of the people who has been at News Channel 5 through almost all of it when I first started working here, had a little wind-up cameras, you know. Is Charlie the priest? They could only shoot three minutes, then they had to stop everything. He's been here 44 years. Hired as a film projectionist in 1960, he now takes satellite feeds in the operations department. No two days are the same. When you come in in the morning, you don't know what's going to happen. It'll be a different day. But uh, it's usually an exciting day. The film editor is now threading one of our two 16-millimeter film projectors. He's seen the changes in technology and the changes in News Channel 5. The station that once had a three-person newsroom now has six hours of news every day. There's also NewsChannel5.com on the Internet and News Channel 5 Plus, the station's own cable channel. And we want to be where our viewers want us to be. So over the next 50 years, boy, you'll find us everywhere that viewers want news. It's been a remarkable journey. Nashville and News Channel 5 have grown, and both are ready for the next 50 years. Those are the departments and some of the people that work to make your televiewing even greater. We hope you've had a pleasant visit with us, and for the very best in television enjoyment, you will dial Channel 5. Ben Hall, News Channel 5. As for the next 50 years, folks, trust me, you ain't seen nothing yet. The best is yet to come. We are now in WLAC-TV's master control room where 240 square feet of glass overlooks our large Studio A. This is the largest TV studio in Nashville, measuring 30 feet by 50 feet. Now in progress is an on-camera rehearsal for one of our more popular daytime programs, Southern Cooking. Other well, we're studio in Studio A, but I believe we're in a different building, are we not, Roy Smith, than we the one you were describing in that building. film? <laughs> yes, we're in a different building. Roy Smith, one of the original employees of Channel 5 that you just saw there on the screen. He retired as the operations manager. Bill Jay joins us also. Uh, everybody knows Bill Jay, retired vice president, director of programming, and Tom Irvin, retired president and general manager. You, Roy, you were one of the original employees. You came later, Bill, and when? In 56. 56. And Tom, you started off from college part-time here, didn't you? Yeah, I was part-time, but I came full-time in 56. As a, as a what? Projectionist? Projectionist. Actually, I was cleaning film. A film my first job. Yeah, I was film cleaner. I <laughs> shipped film and I cleaned film. I got a lot of it. Yeah, that's a profession that no longer exists. <laughs> no, no, thankfully. <laughs> uh, Roy, uh, you went to, to work for Mr. Baker and Mr. Beeman who owned KDA. Right. right. I was a disc jockey at WKDA when they applied for uh, Channel 5. And the way they did that was WSM was on the air. WSIX had just received their their license from the FCC and WLAC radio had applied for Channel 5. So Tom Baker and Al Beeman, who owned WKDA, told WLAC, we're going to apply for Channel 5. And with both of us applying, it's going to take years for the FCC to approve. Then they said, if we agree to go together, 
it'll be quick. So WLAC and Tom Baker and Al Beeman agreed to go together, and soon Channel 5 was granted by the FCC. You know, during that same time, Roy, I remember Tom Baker used to tell the story about the fact that at about the time they had made application, the federal government was uh, thinking about freezing the allocations. Yes. So they were running up against that potentiality. Right. It, that, that sort of stimulated that partnership to take, uh, yes. take shape. Took place. Wasn't the FCC also looking for more, quote, local ownership from individuals rather than big corporations like Life and Casualty was a huge corporation back then? Right. I think that may have played a role. It in may this. have. It now, may here have. in Nashville, Channel was, it's now Channel 2, but it was Channel 8 when it was the first ABC affiliation here. They were locally owned by Louis Drone family in, yeah. uh, in uh, Springfield. As yeah. a matter of fact, the call letters are derived from their advertising slogan from their service station operation yeah. in Springfield. They had a slogan they used where service is excellent. So when they got the television property, they chose SIX, service is excellent. And LAC was life and right. casualty. Right. And SM was We Shield Millions yeah. and WSM Radio. So. Right. Is it true, Roy, is, maybe you all know this story, but I've been told the story since I came here, that the only reason that the competition of Channel 5 started a newscast at 6 o'clock was because we had such a great kid show on at six o'clock in the early, early days, that yes. nothing they could do could, could beat that. Right, we did that. We had a thing called Mr. Music at four o'clock, where we had boy and girl mouthing recordings that we were playing, and then we put on a kid show at five o'clock that ran till the network came on. And the network only had 15 minutes of news. Uh, so we just ran that kid show over till the CBS News came on. And that's got news locally started because nobody could compete with that kid show. So they just tried to do the news. I guess it was cheaper to do in those days. Yeah. And yeah. that's how the news started and it went, went on, on from there. Yeah. And Bill, you, uh, you, you were, you've done everything at this station, just about, except sales maybe, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, you, just about. You, you were the kid I, show Or host. engineering. I, oh, yeah. I, I, I wasn't a very good engineer. Yeah. But you were a kid show host, news director, newscaster? Yeah. I, I, so, I got to do just about everything on air and that kind of thing, and it was, it was a great experience. But it was, it, it, you know, I knew nothing about it when, I, when it when it started, so I made a lot of mistakes, but an also, also uh, I made an awful lot of friends throughout yeah. the coverage area, which is basically Middle Tennessee and Southern Kentucky. Sure. And it, it's been a, a, a lifelong experience, a, a wonderful thing to happen. We had him doing news, we had him doing kid shows, we had him doing hunting and fishing shows. He did just about everything on the television except the cooking show. Somebody else did that. <laughs> you know, that was one of the great things, though, about, about the early days of the station. Uh, we got to do so many different things because we had so few employees yeah. in those days that, you know, you could just volunteer for any line of work and you had the job. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, because the projectionist, which I became when I first got full-time employment here, on the commercial breaks in the movies and in the other program, we literally had to run from the projection room out to the studio to either run a boom mic or a camera. And uh, Really? You oh, were doing both you jobs? You did everything. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it wasn't just me. We all did that. That's yeah. why we learned and learned darn fast, and it was so much fun. How do you, Tom, how do you, you go from cleaning film to running the whole kit and caboodle? Cleaning film was easier. <laughs> <laughs> but because to become the boss, I mean, uh, was that the career track you set for yourself, or, or were you just in a business that grew so fast you were able to move into these areas? I've been asked, you know, why did you get a job in television? And the true answer was, I needed a job. Yeah. And Roy gave it to me. <laughs> Roy hired me when I was in college. Yeah. And, uh, and because we were shorthanded and because I was pretty young and had some energy, they would let me do a lot of different things. And so I guess I uh, had opportunities that I wouldn't have had otherwise. But I really think the reason that I ultimately moved out of the department that Roy ran in the sales was because uh, of the mistakes that I made back in the film department. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> no, really. Uh, a funny quick story yeah. uh, talking about going into the studio. I recall one particular night, our news announcer in those days, uh, Chris, also did a lot of commercials. Now, can you imagine Chris Clark doing commercials in this day and time? But they, they would, that was, oh, listen, they oh, walked yeah. out of the news studio, put on an apron, and did beer commercials. <laughs> and on one particular night, I was projectionist, and on a commercial break, I had to run out to the studio to run what we would call a boom mic. A boom mic was about the size of a cantaloupe. 
Yeah. These things we've got on now about the size of an acorn, but yeah. these things were huge, and they're on the end of a big metal stick. And if you didn't hold down that end of the stick, the boom mic was going to dip towards the announcer on camera. <laughs> And, and because I went to the studio and didn't have time to rehearse the commercial, because I had another job I was doing, I didn't realize that when Al sat down in this chair that he was advertising, that he was going to get up again. <laughs> so when he got up, guess what was waiting for him? That boom mic and knocked him right back down the chair. I told Roy earlier, I think that's the decision-making point that I was going to go into sales. <laughs> well, let me tell you something seriously about that. He learned all about television background by doing all of that stuff. So when he was transferred to the sales department, he was one of the few guys that could get out there selling commercials to sponsors who knew all about television and could tell the sponsors all about television. So say? he carried a lot with him into the sales department. And I'll say this about him, you won't find a keener mind anywhere able to pick up the important things and handle it and, and go with it and make it happen <laughs> than this guy right here. <laughs> I think he's going to say something else next. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about some of the early, early programs uh, that all, you guys were responsible for. Uh, uh, the Popeye show, I guess, was one you hosted, right? Did you ever host Popeye? Or yeah, I, I, I did Popeye for, for a while until they decided they wanted to put me in news. So then when, when that happened, Bob Lobertini was on the scene and doing weather, and he took over the Popeye show, and I, I started doing news full time. Let's talk about Bob Lobertini. I, I heard a story that, uh, that the first research, I mean, this was groundbreaking stuff. The first research, television research in this market, you initiated because you wanted to find out what Bob, how popular Bob Lobertini was. You want to share that story with us? Because I mean, everybody, everybody does research now, but that's Bob, and uh, and share that story well, as much of as you can. Uh, yeah, we we spent a lot of money on doing this research because we felt like we had to know more about what our audiences really expected of us. And this was and groundbreaking stuff. Yeah, back then. It, it, Nobody it really did was. It. Nobody was doing it in those days. Yeah. So we did this research project uh, for a lot of money. I was often reminded <laughs> by and, Mr. Baker, I'm sure. and found out that Bob Lobertini was the number one personality in the market, mm -hmm. and. So far as I know, the change that we made regarding Bob's use on the newscast as the person that introduced the newscast and introduced the news anchor, That's right. the sports guy, I think that was the first station in the, in the country, maybe the first and the last yeah. that did that. But we did that for quite a while. It was, a, it was quite a novel thing to do. Bob anchored the newscast. Sure did. He introduced me, and then he introduced yeah. the, the sports guy. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. it would come back to Bob to hand it off to the sports guy when it came to the sports yeah. segment, as I recall. Then there was a the program early in that, uh, Night Train. Take, take a look at this in case you've never seen Night Train. All aboard, the Night Train now boarding and you have the best seat in the house reserved for you. So let's get rolling to great entertainment. And a opacious hello to you. Buddy and Stacy riding the shockwave with Well, Judy that was Walker, Noble Blackwell, the host the of the program that featured well, African-American talent. Of course, Roy, was, when did that go on the air here? In the early 60s, I think about 1962. Was that um, a groundbreaking thing to have a, a show featuring African-American talent? Yes, it was. Very much uh, uh, the beginning of that sort of thing. And we did it locally. It was very popular. Uh, we were told that uh, they'd only watch it on Friday night and Saturday night, and so we put it in late Friday night and late Saturday night. Both of them were very popular. We syndicated the show nationwide. A lot of people would call and say they wanted to carry the show. So we ran it on about 65 to 70 stations nationwide before uh, very long. When I came here, I never missed it. I was always oh, watching that show. Great TV. We had so much fun you know, producing the program. I was still back in the projection department in those days. Never call when these fellows would come in with their groups to record what we were going to use on these programs. It was it was just so much fun. We had one particular fellow whose name was Ironing Board Sam. <laughs> and uh, Jimmy Hendrix back then. The, yeah. the, the, the guitar oh, gosh, we had the biggest yeah. names in the business, yeah. really. Yeah. They became the biggest, yeah, I yeah, should yeah. say. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. But th well, this one particular performer, Ironing Board Sam, would arrive in a in an old Cadillac convertible and park it out in the alley. And I don't know how many tickets he acquired from parking that car in the alley, but I know he got a <laughs> Lots job of them, I recall Lots that. <laughs> and one particular night he came into the studio and set up all of his rig, and he literally had a keyboard on an ironing board. And he had all these, ampli all, all these amplifiers. 
And on one particular occasion, smoke began to billow out from some of this equipment. And I believe it was Reed Skinner you talked to earlier, Chris, yeah. who came running out of the control room with a fire extinguisher. <laughs> and Arnie Mort said, don't do that. That's the soul coming out. <laughs> I'm amazed at the quality of the program. And that's been a hallmark at Channel 5. Oh. When, I, when I came here in 66, uh, I was so impressed with the quality of everything I saw on the air. You guys must have really worked hard at keeping the quality up. If, if you want to work for Tom Baker, that what, you had to do that, or you would be staying in this television station. He absolutely demanded top-line jobs and top-line equipment. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, n another program uh, was Country Junction. Um, and, let's, and let's take a look at, at that just real quick, a brief look at that. Morning, like a sack full of bullfrogs in the springtime. Carl Smith's coming in, and I reckon the whole town will be here to meet him. And I bet half of them will bring a fiddle or a guitar with them. Oh, yeah. I don't think you did. I did it. That's it. So how did this story come about? How, how, did, how did this show come about? Well, we uh, received a phone call from the vice president of CBS in New York. Uh, television was not popular in the early morning hours originally and the Today Show became popular and CBS wanted to do something to compete with that. Well their intent was to do a country music show and they called us to do a country music show. So we prepared and did the Country Junction show for CBS. Fit it up uh, on the telephone line. They cut a kinescope of it uh, which was their way of doing business in those days. And that was nothing more than setting up a movie camera in front of right, a TV set and photographing. Right, and uh, later I got a call back from the vice president in charge of programming who said that uh, that show was the best one we had, but we're going to take another show from Washington, D.C. Why? Well, I learned later that the reason was they had a telephone line that reached from Washington to New York 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If they took our show from Nashville, Tennessee, they had to establish another telephone line. So they decided that for money reasons, they'd produce something out of Washington, D.C. Uh, and that was the telephone line like we normally think about, just a plain telephone. These are yeah, more sophisticated pieces of equipment and yeah. it would have cost them some money. Yeah. yeah, oh yeah, yeah. So they took the Jimmy Dean show. You, you mentioned kinescope. I want to just back up in time for just a minute. You were the projectionist. Right. Uh, you had a lot. You had to run a lot of kinescopes. Oh, I mean, I hated the summertime because when the when the uh, when the time what they call daylight savings time yeah. was first established, uh, stations in the central part of the country were actually mailed their programs on these kinescope reels, which is just a big film reel. Mm -hmm. So the projectionist in those days, I mean, was responsible for so much product. If we'd not had the kinescope sent to us from CBS, we would not have had a, ne a, a network program on in the evenings. So we ran all of those programs all summer long on kinescope. This is yeah. a lot black of and white work, and black and white, black and white, yeah. poor but quality. That's, quality that's, but right? that's what we had, and yeah. that's what we did. And so it, the projectionists in those days were very busy. <laughs> well, one of the Lots events of that the the film department had uh, was there was a, a racial battle in Little Rock, Arkansas in the late 50s. And Harry Reasoner, who was a CBS newsman, came down here and he went to Little Rock to cover the story with a film man. They would film the events over there, give it to us, we would develop the film, interrupt our afternoon movie, and Harry Reasoner would do the story back to New York with the film they'd shot in Little Rock. They'd kinescope it in New York and then when their newscast came on, they'd play that story back. Well, we had it twice. We had to interrupt our afternoon movie to do the film. Yes, you had to do it on the air to get yeah. it to New York? Yes. Yeah. Goodness gracious. And then they'd feed it back <laughs> on the news. So that's the way we did it. We were happy to do it. We had Harry Reason. We were feeding CBS. That was a good thing to do. That was a good stroke. Yeah. Uh, 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 we're in Studio A, and this is the studio where Hee Haw was... Recorded. Let's take a quick look at that and I want you to tell us the inside story of how we got here. Okay. Fascinating story. Take a yeah. look at this.
Now, the story of how Hee Haw came to the station involves Roy and Tom, I think. You guys decide how you're going to tell the story, because it's, it's a fascinating story. Well, it started with Sam Lavallo producer. calling me. He's a producer. He was the producer of Hee Haw, but at the time, he was in charge. He was vice president in charge of finance, CBS Los Angeles. And he called me and said that they wanted to do an hour-long special of country music. And he wanted me to supply him with some names of people that uh, they could book to come to California to do that. And I used the wrong word. I said, that's stupid. <laughs> and he said, what do you mean? You're calling me stupid? I said, well, I'm not calling you stupid. It's a stupid idea. Let me tell you why. <laughs> if you book a country music artist from Nashville and send him to California, you've got to buy an airplane ticket. They're going to take their wife, their manager, their girlfriend, <laughs> somebody with them, and you've got to buy two tickets. You've got to put them in a hotel room. You've got to rent them a car. And then you've got to pay them for their appearance. Here in Nashville, if you do that, you can book them in and do the show. He said, well, how do I book them in? I said, go out on the front porch of our station, blow a whistle, and they'll all come running. <laughs> and that's the way you need to do it. Well, he and three or four other people came to look over our studios. This was the new studio that was built here. This is the one we're in right now, yeah. Yeah. He came and looked at it and said, uh, I think we could do it here. We assigned Studio B to it. They also sent us the uh, uh, blueprints of the sets they wanted and said the set fellow was coming to build them. And uh, our man built them, put them in the studio, because everything on the blueprint was understandable to our carpenter. He knew it. You could just go down to the hardware store and buy that stuff, you know. So we built it, and when the, the carpenter man came and looked at it, he said, that's great, that we'll do it right here. And that's where they decided to do it. After that, he took off to, to uh, Miami, Florida for a week's vacation and told me not to let anybody know he's there. He was supposed to be building the set. We had him built when he came in. But uh, Tommy was out in, in, uh, in Hollywood during the time they were deciding all of this. And uh, he went by to uh, talk to him and tell him all of this in person after my phone call. So he, he got to help sell it in person out there, didn't you? Well, one of the advantages, I think, was we had just completed this television station. And yeah. this, this was the newest television station in the country at the time. And you interviewed uh, Ralph Huckabee here earlier, and he told you about how he had done this and, how, and where we were in the state of art. Mm -hmm. And so I had that knowledge and I had some brochures about the station because I was on a sales call in California at the time. And Roy called me and told me of his discussion with uh, Sam. And so he had two names that I was challenged to find in Hollywood. And they were the guys who owned, I believe, the program watch that CBS had an interest in. Right. So I went to see... Uh, Frank Peppiet and John Dalesworth, and I found them at, uh, in, in L.A. and convinced them that they needed to bring the director and others back to Nashville on the airplane and to see what we had here in town because they didn't really believe that we had that kind of facility. And one of the guys that came here was at the time the manager of CBS Studios in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. So they brought him along just to confirm that we did in fact have a facility here that they could produce that program in. And they came back here, and Roy, as Roy said, they, they were very impressed with what they saw here. We made one little bottle in that trip, and that was when we went to the airport in two or three limousines to pick up this crowd of people coming in from L.A. <laughs> we left the director at the airport. That <laughs> was Bill Davis. That's right, Bill Davis. Yeah. And uh, we realized that we sat down to lunch, so we raced back out to the airport yeah. and got Bill, got him in tow, but he was okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah he was all right. That was funny. Yeah. Channel 5 has done a lot of things first. And I remember a very unusual election return that we did. Statewide network. First time that had been the... Uh, yes, that was in... I think the first time we did that on a round... What they called a round-robin network was 1966. I was in sales at the time. And um, I, think the, I think the idea originated in the sales department, as I recall, with a lot of consultation with people in the news. It's what we could and couldn't do. But we actually organized a network of stations throughout the state of Tennessee. And the telephone company uh, finally understood what we were trying to do, 
Which is unusual in those days. Very unusual. And they didn't have the facility at that point to even put that kind of network together. But because they had to make such a big initial investment in the landlines to get that done, they became one of our broadcast sponsors of the... Uh, of the broadcast. And so we put together this six station <coughs> network that covered every television station in the state. <coughs> Each of those stations on the network had the responsibility for collecting the votes out of their particular markets, getting that information by telephone back to us here in Nashville, and then we'd, we would broadcast that uh, statewide. No one had ever done that before. And uh, Harold Crump, whose name needs to be mentioned here too, yes. was a vital part of organizing all of that. And uh, he and I then had the responsibility for selling uh, that particular program throughout the state and uh, we got that job done and so then we did that for several years of course now that seems silly now because now you collect a vote in just a few minutes yeah. but, you, but also those days, you also had a component there though too of entertainers well we did we did because you know inter entertainment i mean yeah, they of the, uh, See, remember that picture? Uh, yeah, yeah. There we are. Bob Crane, yes. And uh, yep. I believe yep. Roger Mudd was here, too, from CBS News on that. He was or, one year. Yes. One year. Roger Dan Rather was here the yeah. other year. And yeah. I think Harry Reid Dan Rather, here. one year. Yeah. yeah. But they came in and, and worked for us here in, in the local market, statewide market. But that was a... That was an imaginative kind of thing to do, and thank goodness Tom Baker let us take on those kinds of projects. And it became, yeah. it, we all became smarter because of doing those things. It, well, one of the important things was that uh, it cost us $1,800 to do that, and Salesforce sold a quarter of the programming sponsorship to Southern Bell for $2,500. So we made profit off of those people that we had to convince <laughs> to organize, well, help us organize this thing. Tom Baker was a good teacher. <laughs> yes, he was. I've got to mention a couple of shows, and one is Woods and Waters. We could not go without Woods and Waters. Well, it was a fun show to do uh, because we were hunting and fishing and lying and... and uh, <laughs> getting and, paid for it. And, and just having a good time and, and getting paid for it and, and also bringing home uh, some, you know, a, a fish every yeah. now and then. <laughs> we cook it up and, and then uh, kill a deer sometimes and you know yeah. and, and 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 I had I, I hosted the show it was on the air uh, under the name of Woods and Waters when when I when I was hired but they let me pick, pick up on the show and, and do it and, um, and you, you, so, you very much made it your own show it, it became you my, my co-host <laughs> and and I, uh, I I had a co-host fella by the name of Bill Clay who uh, uh, had a sporting goods store, and his uh, his uh, I, I came to believe that one of his main goals in life was to f uh, foil everything I would try to do because he tried <laughs> he would he would lie to me he would he would he would uh, I, I'll give you one little quick example here. We had been fishing on Kentucky Lake all day one day, and Clay always had me drive his car on our fishing trips and I didn't mind that because his cars were newer than mine and and so anyway we were coming back from Kentucky Lake in between Clarksville and Nashville about halfway there's a long hill that goes down to across a creek and halfway down there was a, a, a an old time motel that wasn't in, in business anymore and as we going down this hill, I, I spotted this radar, which was on a tripod that, back then, in the early days of radar. So I knew I was had, because I was, I was exceeding the speed limit. <laughs> so sure enough, parked down at this old motel, as soon as I got in sight of it, here's the, here's the, the, the whirling uh, roof light and the spotlight running up and down and so I pull up in front of it and get out and walk over toward this spotlight right in my face and and uh, and this big voice comes out of uh, behind the spotlight and said you realize you're doing 65 miles an hour on a 55 mile zone I said yes I realize going a little fast but it's late night not much traffic on the road and I'm a pretty safe driver and I, I, I'm like you know I was really uh, <laughs> talking it up to sell myself yes. all the way I could and by this time Clay rolled the window down and he said give him a dang ticket I've been telling him he's driving too fast <laughs> <for the next hour." laughs> and the cop said no Mr. Clay I can't do it he just get fixed that's all <laughs> <laughs> in the Eddie Hill show, that was another another good one. Yes, it was, it was the early morning show that started out. We called it Country Junction at the beginning. That's right. 
But we hired Eddie Hill to be the host of that show. And he was the host from 1955, when we called it Country Junction, up until 1968 when he got sick. But he did a great job for us. He also did Heaven's Jubilee, which was a gospel music program on Sunday morning, and we syndicated it nationwide. See, all these local programs that you guys syndicated, <clears throat> well, I want to thank both of you for hiring me. <laughs> I mean, I, I appreciate that a whole lot. <laughs> well, I, I found you at the University of Georgia in Atlanta when I made a speech at the uh, Georgia Association of Broadcasters. Yeah. You got a good report down there. Well, so thank you. We're I think, glad you, to I, have I think you. you assigned Bill to give me the call, and, and Bill did. Thank <laughs> goodness for, for that. <laughs> and uh, we're glad you took the job too. Well, Chris. I'm glad too. <laughs> now let me give you guys a quiz. Do you remember the first color news story that we did? It was the first color news story in this town. Do you remember? Do you I remember, remember what it is? Do I you remember, remember what it is? I don't think I do. I don't think I do either. It was well, by the name of John Smith put it together. That's right. And well, uh, I remember John he, Smith. And he, uh, he, he, what he did is he fi he filmed on color film uh, a, a feature story. Was all it was. It wasn't a hard news story, yeah, but I, it was a feature story. I was in it. Uh, I was in it. And, and, and so John filmed it in, that, in here in town. And then he, there was no color development of, of, of movie film in Nashville. He drove it to Atlanta, got it, got it processed there, drove it back, edited it, put it on the air as, as the first color news film we ever put on the air. And we, we made hay out of that by touting our own, or blowing right. our own horn, you know, as first, much as we could. The first story I did here was a color story and we, by then, were shipping it to Atlanta and came back. And you know what the subject of it was? It was the new telephone book cover. Oh, really? <laughs> and that passed for news back in 1966. <laughs> yeah. It was good and yellow. <laughs> Willard, Willard uh, Young, I guess, yeah. he was, was head of the telephone company. Willard Young. And, and he was in it, and I interviewed him. We often reminisce ab yeah, about that. Really. And you wouldn't do a dare, dare to a story like that today. Yeah. Well, you know, you were talking earlier. By in, 10 seconds. In another. 20 seconds. I better not get into it then. We'll do it in another segment. Oh, okay. About color. Okay, good. We'll talk, we'll talk some more about that. We have other segments coming up that we'll be talking about more about the history of News Channel 5. And I'll be right back with a final word in just a minute. You know, it's hard for people watching television today to realize how primitive it was at the beginning, yeah. how much fun it was to be doing things for the first time. Thank all of you for, for being with us and for helping make News Channel 5 what it is today. Your creativity and originality has really paid off in great television for Nashville. Thanks for being with us.